we're going to throw out a, a challenge to you. That's why you have those green leaves. A uh, challenge to our church and a challenge to uh, trust God. I'm calling this a, a trust challenge. And so my sermon this morning, I've titled it, In God We Trust. Now, that phrase right away may make you think of money. Uh, if you look on our bills, our coins, you will still find that phrase, in God we trust. And uh, Wikipedia at least told me that at one point, or it still is, the motto for the United States, in God we trust. Whether we still believe that or not as a nation, I don't know. But there is a connection between trust and money, especially in our culture. You know, sometimes I think we tend to say and even act on uh, in money we trust instead of in God we trust, or in my family I trust, or in my job I trust, or in my sports team I trust, or you, know, you fill in the blank. Now, to be, to be honest with you guys, this, this idea, this trust challenge uh, it came from our, our finance team. Uh, we have a finance team that helps us to kind of think wisely about money and finances, about giving and uh, budgets and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and they wanted to kind of throw out a challenge, encourage all of us to trust God more, not just with our finances, but with everything. Um, you know, we, we don't want just kind of mindless givers or it's just what I've always done, uh, worshipers, we want to have people fully trusting in God from uh, when they are baptized and until they, they pass away. So here's what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to explain this kind of challenge idea I'm going to give you. Um, I'm going to preach about it from Psalm 56 and then give you some time to respond to that. So this trust challenge that we're, we're announcing today, it's going to be kind of from now until Easter. Easter is April 17th, so um, there's, if you're counting today and Easter, 50 days in there. Um, but we're asking to maybe start it tomorrow, February 28th, to the day before Easter, the 16th, to end this on Easter Sunday morning, and we're going to challenge you, uh, I'm going to participate in this, but challenge you to give up something and to give it to God. You can think about it like a fast, maybe. When you fast, you fast from a food or a meal, you don't eat that meal, and then instead you might replace it with something toward God, a prayer, um, scripture reading, um, your, your hunger pains toward that food, you want to replace with your hunger toward God. Now, some of you who maybe grew up in um, maybe more of a traditional liturgical church um, might be thinking, this sounds like Lent. And you might know that Lent is starting this next week. And so this trust challenge I'm offering to you is like Lent, but not like Lent. Uh, just to be honest, I have never practiced Lent in my, my life. Um, I'm just kind of curious, anybody here, you've practiced Lent at some point. You've done something in those 40 days. Okay. Um, so this is kind of what I learned this, this recently. I've got some Catholic friends that I've been talking to and did some research. But, you know, Lent starts this Wednesday. It's called Ash Wednesday. It's always kind of 46 days before Easter Sunday, um, but the, it only counts as 40 days because they don't count the Sundays. I learned this over Lent that uh, you don't have to practice giving up that thing on Sundays. So if you give up Netflix during the week, you can binge Netflix on Sundays. That's, that's what I understand. Um, but it's this, supposed to be this time marked by repentance and fasting, reflection, um, even kind of representing Jesus 40 days in the desert, being hungry, fasting himself. Uh, some of my Catholic friends talk about um, even adding something maybe 
Um, they add a, a prayer practice or they might give up chocolate or soda or meat or they'd go on a diet. Um, but it's meant to be this kind of preparing for Easter and they'll, they'll have different colors displayed like purple. Thus, I'm wearing purple this morning, totally by coincidence. Um, you cannot say the word Alleluia during Lent. I was once uh, during Lent at a church playing in a worship band, um, and we started playing some worship songs, and we, we started playing a song that had Alleluia in it during Lent, and we had people come yelling and screaming up to us, don't say the A word, which was Alleluia, I guess. You cannot say Alleluia during Lent. Time of confession, uh, charity, um, giving of something. And uh, yeah, it begins with this Wednesday of ashes on people's forehead and the sign of a cross. Now, for us, for Lighthouse, we want it to be kind of like how Advent is for Christmas. Uh, this is preparation for Easter. Now, it's, it's not going to be like that maybe Catholic idea of Lent that maybe you grew up with as we're not going to celebrate Ash Wednesday. I'm going to encourage you not to take Sundays off. I don't want it to be some sort of rote tradition that you just do because it's not about dieting. Um, it's not just about kind of giving up a bad habit like chewing your fingernails. This is not because our budget is doing bad. Our budget is doing great. But as I said, it is a preparation for Easter to help you trust in God more. To give something up that you enjoy, that you want, that you trust in maybe, to give then that desire over to God. So I'm going to have you think about that this morning. And then at the end, we're going to use those green leaves to write something on that. Write down what you're going to try and give up, trust God in these next 48 days. And then we'll have kind of a display out there um, for that. And you can do that anonymously. So let's turn now to Psalm 56. And uh, you'll notice maybe in some of your Bibles that Psalm 56, the title is In God I Trust. Uh, I'm going to actually read the, the subtitle also to this. So Psalm 56, to the choir master, according to the dove on Far off Terebinths, a miktam of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For, for their crime will they escape in wrath. Cast down the peoples, O God. You, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then, then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. It's always good when you read the Psalms to look at that subtitle you find there sometimes. Sometimes you may find some things that are not always helpful, like a, a miktam or how they would sing it. Uh, but this gives us a sense of what is going on uh, here behind the scenes. This is written by David. Um, he, at this time, is the anointed king, but not the ruling king. Saul is still ruling. He's um, on the run from Saul and on the run, just in general, from all kinds of people. And 
this thing says, you know, when the Philistines seized David at Gath. This is from 1 Samuel 21. So I'm just going to read this to you. This is what's going on in David's life when he writes this psalm. Think about this psalm as I read to you 1 Samuel 21. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the, and the servants of Achish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Didn't, didn't they, they sing to one another of him and dances? Saul struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do, do I lack madmen? That you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David is anointed king, but he is on the run. He is being pursued by Saul. He goes to this guy who is afraid of him, so he pretends to act crazy to make markings, just have drool run down his face, and this is what he feels like he has to do. He is afraid, and this is the, the thing that comes out of his mouth. This psalm, in the midst of being afraid and worried and scared for his life and all of his men's life, he begins with this, just be gracious to me, oh God. You may have noticed that three times in this text. Oh, God. He just asks for God's grace. That's all, that's all we can ever ask for, right, is God's amazing grace in our lives. And he, he just says there's these people, this, this, he, he says this man, this attacker, my enemies. There's many, these people, Saul and this king, they're, they're, they're coming to, to get me. And he describes it as being trampled upon. They're oppressing him. He mentions it twice, that all day long he feels this. There's no rest that he has. Not only do they attack me, but they attack me proudly, he says. And then in verses 5 through 7, he just describes them as they. They're, they're injuring him. All their thoughts are against him. They're, they're stirring up strife. They're lurking, trying to find him, watching his steps, waiting for him. And he just says, God... What, what will their consequences be? I mean, what, what, will they escape for their crime? Like, are you going to do anything? Oh, God. And in verse 3, he just says, I'm afraid. He says, when I am afraid, he is frightened. He fears for his life. Now, what we usually do here, if you're new this morning, is we, we look at the text, we look at the, the words of God, we look at the context even, when, when it was written, and then we begin to ask the question, okay, how does this apply to us? And, and I think we can all kind of relate to this in some way. Maybe we weren't pursued to death by somebody, but we've been in places we've been afraid and scared, not knowing what the future brings, maybe f afraid for our family, friends, all that kind of stuff. Even as believers, as Christians, we go through that. Jesus in chapter 16, John 16, 33, he says this strange thing. He says, I have told you these things, talking to his disciples, talking to us, so that in me you ha may have peace. That's good, right? You may have peace. But then he says, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's a strange kind of sandwich of ideas, right? I mean, you'll have peace, I've overcome the world, but you will always have trouble in this world. So this is just kind of point one this morning. We talk about trust and all this kind of stuff. Just that phrase we find in John, in this life, you will have trouble. I mean, you may describe that trouble as people, as, as David did. These guys are pursuing me, they're against me, they, they blast me on social media or whatever. Or, or maybe you have trouble from just nature, I mean, natural disasters or animals attacking you or squirrels, I don't know, you know, attacking you or even from ourselves, our own mind, our thoughts attacking us or, or Satan or demons or our own community attacking us in this world. You will have trouble, believer or, or not. 
I think I've said this before, but I, I was so touched by this years ago. I think it was back in 2010. I, I saw a, a preacher, his name was Matt Chandler, speak um, about himself having brain cancer. And he said before that he had preached through the book of Philippians. And Philippians is this book that talks about joy and joy and joy over again, even in the midst of terrible suffering and trouble. And he said to a group of pastors, he said, pastors, prepare your people well for suffering. He didn't know that he was going to preach that whole thing on Philippians and have joy in the midst of suffering and then get brain cancer. But in God's good sovereign choice, he did. And he recovered and he's still doing ministry today. But my hope is that I would prepare you well for trouble and suffering. Uh, I almost, I, I don't want to share this with you because it means that I'll have to do it. But I, I've been considering writing a book. Um, because then, see, if I tell you now, you'll ask me about it and keep me accountable to that. And um, yeah. <laughs> I've been considering writing a book, and, the, and the, the title I have working in my mind is this idea of depressed, anxious Christian. Um, I don't know if some of you could, could relate to, I mean, as Kelly talked about depression and anxiety, and especially over these last couple years uh, that we've been through, but that's, that's been my experience. I've had depression for many years and uh, have experienced anxiety in the past couple of years, but I am a believer in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What does that look like? I mean, Jesus says in that passage in John 16, 33, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Even with depression, anxiety, and all kinds of that junk in this life, we can know that we have Christ for us. And Paul even says these crazy things when he's talking about suffering in his own life. He says in Philippians 3, um, that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. He, he wants to share in Jesus' sufferings. Or, or in Colossians 1.24, now I rejoice in my sufferings. That's crazy talk. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. He's not saying that Jesus' cross was insufficient or lacking, but we all suffer with Christ uh, continually. So in this simple, smaller, you know, trust challenge I'm offering to you today, you will have trouble, right? You will have maybe physical hunger pains if you give up some sort of food or whatever. You may become angry or hangry, or maybe it's a loss of funds that you might have, or, you know, if you choose like some sort of caffeine, coffee, whatever, a loss of caffeine. I mean, these are all little things to help you in the future to trust him when life gets that much harder. So, so what, what, do, what should you do when you are afraid or suffering or in trouble as a believer? I, I came in contact just recently with a family that um, husband, wife, little kid, little kid was suffering, um, trying to get healthier and better. And the, the dad was explaining to me what was going on with the kid and he was saying, my, my wife has just been so distraught. She's been crying over this and so sad for our son. And, and the dad said, I, I said to her, I said, no, you should not cry over this. We trust in God. And I thought to myself, is that really what it means as a Christian to trust in God in the midst of pain? That we have no emotions, no crying, no fear at all. We just, nope, we're going to trust in God. I don't think that's the example we have here in, in Psalm 56. I mean, David says in verse 3, I'm afraid. He says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. This happens so often in the Psalms. Trust. Here's a few examples. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide 
in the shadow of the Almighty. It will be, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Psalm 40, verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. These two are really tied together. Psalm 146. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Don't trust in people. Or Psalm 20 he says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Or even in the Proverbs, Proverbs 3, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. So when you are afraid, like David did, put your trust in God. And you can take that phrase and, and just kind of fill in the blank. When you are suffering, put your trust in God. When you are anxious, put your trust in God. When you are sad, depressed, put your trust in God. When you are stressed out, put your trust in God. Trust is this, this reliance, this you know, being relaxed, sitting to believe, to count on, to have faith in you know, I, I trust my wife. I trust the, the word of God. I don't always trust the internet. I, I had a discussion with a, a great friend, a person I love, who really believed something about Jar Jar Binks from Star Wars, and he scoured the internet for this information. He's like, I just don't know if I trust the internet about that. I don't always trust the Chicago Bears. They're my team, but they're terrible a lot of times. Um, which is why I'm now choosing a soccer team, Liverpool. Anybody? Soccer? Uh, I'm going to try to make you soccer fans. Uh, I don't always trust buffet sushi or gas station sushi. But David says, in God I trust. I found this great phrase. It says, a staff not used gives no support. You know, we, we looked at Psalm 146 and Psalm 20. I mean, there are all these things about, you know, don't, don't trust in people. Don't trust in horses and chariots and all these things that can, can let you down and will, but put your trust in God. And he says, in God's word, who I praise, the, the word of God, these promises, these, these true stories, all these things that we read in here, we trust in the God who made this. Notice this progression too that David has in Psalm 56 in these few verses. Verse 3, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Do you see that? He starts with, I'm afraid, I put my trust in God, I am not afraid. Now, it's not always that simple, right? When you are afraid, you're suffering, whatever, you're in trouble, trust, not afraid. But how do you practically do that? You know, you, you have to decide in your mind, even if you don't feel it. You step out in faith. You say it out loud when you're in the midst of trouble. God, I trust in you, and you will relieve me of this pain, and I then will not be afraid. He has this phrase, too, what can flesh do to me? What can man do to me? If I trust in the God who spoke things into existence, if I trust in the God who is almighty, all-powerful, knows everything, all good, what can that guy do to me? And then he repeats it. Did you notice that? In verse 10, 11, he repeats the same things again. In God, his word I praise. In the Lord, his word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. It's almost like he's reminding himself. My, my mentor and coach, Tom, talks about, as pastors, as elders, we need to be CROs for our church, chief reminding officers. I think the same thing for us as individuals. We need to keep reminding ourselves of the good news of the gospel and what it means to trust in Jesus. And as you saw, these people here that were baptized, they came to put their trust in Jesus. They then said, I want to tell other people and to trust in Jesus, and then they will continue to trust in Jesus. 
and, and then he will sustain that trust and complete us on into eternity. This is a, a call out to you now, not just for the next 48 days, but if you have not put your complete trust in Jesus, now is the time. I told you I'm going to do something these next 48 days. I'm going to hold off uh, maybe till next week to tell you what I'm going to do because I don't want to influence you. But during my time, I'm going to have times of um, uh, some pain and time toward this. And my, my plan is to take that time and to spend it in Bible reading and prayer each day. I, I want to deepen that practice and create that habit in my own life that when deeper, harder pain comes along, I know what to do. When I am afraid, I will trust in God. David gives this one little help also, I think, for us in verse 8 in how we're to trust God when we are afraid, and it's this knowledge that David has. Um, so number three, know that God cares for you deeply. He says, God, you, you've counted all of my tossings. He's, he's just been on his bed, tossing back and forth, crying, upset, mad, angry. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? These are all means of, of, of counting, keeping track. Um, God is keeping record in some way to, to show us that he cherishes our, our pain, cherishes us, that he is close to us in the midst of trouble and suffering and pain, so much so that he would keep uh, our, our pain in, in a bottle or a book or no what we are going through. You know, I mentioned that, that book idea to you, and as I said, I, I've experienced those things in my own life of anxiety and depression, and I, I can relate um, to these uh, phrases here, tears, tossing. I mean, there, there were some times these last couple of years where I, I was weeping, I was angry, I was questioning things. And what a comfort to know that God is not distant from us in those times, but even closer to us in a sense. Uh, Psalm 139 says this, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path am I lying down you're acquainted with all my ways even before a word is on my tongue behold the Lord you you know it all together you you hem me in before and behind and lay your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me it's high I can't attain it it's not just that God knows and he's up there kind of like okay I got all this knowledge but he deeply cares and acts upon it also I love these these, these phrases that you find in Exodus 2 when, when God hears of his people who are I I captive in Egypt. It says, and God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And if you read on, he acts. God sees your hurt and pain, and if he cares, he will do something about it. When I trust in someone, uh, I know they care for me. I can freely kind of go to them and express my emotions. You have an advocate in Jesus Christ, not only someone that will listen and know, but who will then act on and do so when you feel pain in some way these next 48 days, think of the cross. Think of Jesus Christ and how he trusted in his 
Father in times of need. So finally, in this psalm, we we see what all this kind of produces, this fear to to trust. It, yeah, takes away fear, but it produces even more. And and what I'm going to call this revolutionary trust, it then produces something. See in David's life and your own life over the next 48 days what it will produce. I'm calling it this, this revolutionary trust because I think when a watching world sees our trust in Jesus, sees you the next 48 days and you kind of skipping a lunch or giving this up or whatever, that it's not going to make any sense. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be ridiculous. And a watching world will notice that. And then how you turn to Christ in that time, it will spark things. I I pray for revival in your own heart, that this would draw you closer to Christ. Revival in your family, your friends around you, this revolution of renewed trust in our Savior in this season as a a church. For David, uh, he he sees his enemies then turn back. He becomes king at one point. He just has this knowledge in verse 9. This just struck me and hit me this, this past week and Verse 9, at the end he says, This I know that God is for me. And just let that sink in for a minute, that God is for you. When someone is for you, they, they believe in you, they, they cheer for you, they, they love you. This morning, my soccer team, Liverpool, is playing my brother's soccer team, Chelsea. Not that anybody else cares. But I will cheer for Liverpool. I believe in them, I think. I don't know if I'd say I love them, but it's that same sense that, you know, you, you, when you have someone believe in you as God believes, leaves in you is for you i mean this this great passage in romans 8 i love this romans 8 31 it says what then shall we say to these things if god is for us who can be against us he who did not even spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also with him graciously give us all things who shall bring any charge against god's elect It's God who justifies. Who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Will anything separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. I mean, as it's written, I mean, for your sake, we're being killed all day long. We're like sheep going to slaughter. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the God that is for you, that you can trust in. Think an amen. And David says, I want to respond. I want to perform these vows and render offerings. And, 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 and all this kind of goes along with what we believe as Christians, that we, we respond to God's work in our life. Something may happen. We begin to trust in him. And then, you know, we are saved. And we, then we respond. Responding comes last. It then should change you. So now is the time. I'm going to pull those pieces of paper out. I'd like you to anonymously write something on there. Something you're willing to give up, to fast in, to trust God in with us together. And uh, as we leave today, we'll, we'll collect those and kind of display them out there. But you can take some time during this last song or as I pray to kind of write that. Or if you just like, I need, I need some time to think about it, you can bring them back to church. Psalm 139 says this. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Maybe there's some things in your life that you want God to take away, some sin habits or um, don't make it too easy. Don't make it impossible, (laughs) but not too easy. It should have some hurt to it. I mean, here's, here's some ideas. You could literally fast. You could take a meal um, once a day or once a week and say, I'm going to take this time instead to pray or, or, or to uh, spend time reading my Bible. You, it could be, could be money in some sense. You could um, choose to start tithing or to give uh, above and beyond your tithe, your offering. Uh, or something kind of related to money, you could give something up that you spend on, shopping or coffee, and give that to God. It could be social media you choose to give that. It could be TV, streaming. Um, it could be a time commitment. I'm going to commit this time, God, to you to listen, to pray, to read. You could, you could give up non-Christian music to, um, to, to just listen to Christian music. One time I, I gave up the radio at all in my car and use that time to pray. Or, or maybe it's a sin habit you need to break in your life. Maybe it's something like gossip or, or swearing or, or, or drinking or smoking or pornography or lying or you fill in the blank. I'm going to give us just a, a few seconds of kind of silence for you to kind of pray and to write and think about it. Then I'll pray and then we'll close our time in worship, and you're welcome to drop those things off um, in the back as we go. Father, I desire to desire you more. I confess that there are lots of times in my life that I do not desire you, that I trust in other things, that I trust in my own confidence, that I trust in food or, or music or whatever. And Father, I lay those things down before you now and ask that you would take this this season as we lead up to Easter to remind us of Christ's suffering as we we suffer with Christ and to experience that hardship. Remind us of the cross and what you've done that we don't do these things to earn our salvation, but to say thank you, to give back to you, God, to say that you have saved us by your grace It's only through our faith and trust in you that we can even be believers and Christians. And so, Father, take this time now, take this song, take this this kind of trust challenge these next 48 days and let us give it to you and grow. And would it spark this revival season of deeper trust and, and just love for you, Jesus. We pray this all. In Jesus' precious name, amen.